I'm uh, Penn Gillette, my partner Teller. We are Penn and Teller. We do a show called Penn and Teller Fool Us. We're the best magicians in the world. Come on and try to fool us. And uh, not many of them do. But then we met uh, Helen Coughlin with her father, Arthur, a Gold Coast father and daughter team that came on the show. And uh, that was the first time we met them. But it turns out they have been bamboozling audiences, performing incredible escapes and uh, making the impossible possible for years and years and years. Dad's really big break came when the Don Lane show invited him on the show and he decided he'd have to come up with something pretty big. It was in the late 70s and at the time the Don Lane show was the top you know, show in Australia. If you were on the Don Lane show, you were it. You were made. Arthur Coughlin, the country's leading escapologist, will be performing for us a world first Houdini type escape. I knew I had to come up with something unique, spectacular, and also had to be dangerous. Not just appear to be dangerous, it had to be dangerous. Arthur will be sealed and locked in uh, that steel barrel and the barrel's gonna be hoisted to a height of 100 feet. We had crane operators and we had, you know, Don and people running around saying, this is going to be extraordinary, I hope he doesn't die. As soon as they reach 100 feet, the bottom of the box will automatically open and it will crash to the concrete surface below. And we have hopes that Arthur will be out of it before uh, it crashes to the bottom anyway. The lid went on and it was pitch black inside the drum, so I couldn't see a thing. I had 90 seconds to get out. I knew exactly what I had to do, but unfortunately, it, it didn't work. And that's when I started a panic, because I was stuck. When I first started out, I thought it had to be dangerous for people to watch it. I don't think anybody wants to see anybody die, but by the same means, people don't want to miss it if it's going to happen. They don't. <laughs> Other magicians around the world, they all aspire to Arthur because he creates original magic and escapology and I don't think anybody else in the world will ever come close, even Houdini. Whatever he comes up with in here, he can make happen. He can just build it. He's 89, and he's still bringing joy to people's faces, even to this day. My memories were always of Arthur and Helen being on stage. Hey, Dad. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. So am I. <laughs> she became his assistant quite young. First. I don't know whether it's being a father and daughter that just made it so natural and they seem to just kind of bounce off each other so beautifully. They're two of the finest minds in magic. He can build the stuff and design it and then Helen executes it beautifully. Fullest trophy to our next magician. We've been on Penn and Teller Fool Us three times. We're hoping to be the first person in the world to fool them the fourth time with this escape that Dad's come up with. And hopefully we will. This one. So I will be locked inside this cage with the shelves completely around me. And finally. And I'll be completely immobile, won't be able to move. Yeah, they're a lot easier to put these shelves in since That's I a good idea. found those edges on. It gets locked, the key's removed, and I hopefully will be out within 45 seconds. Hey, hey Dad, just one question. Yep. How the hell am I supposed to get out of this? That's your problem. <laughs> I think he just likes that challenge of doing something that fools people, and the more people that are fooled, the better. I've got no idea how I come up with the solutions. Sometimes it might take me months, but I always take the attitude, nothing is impossible. Everything's a great escape. From his days in the, when he was a kid in the war, 
um, his things that he's just been able to escape from. At the time when Dad was a kid in Liverpool, the World War II was happening and he doesn't like talking about that very much because I think as a eight or a nine year old boy, he saw some things that were very distressing to him. I think when you see all these lives lost around you, young lives, you think, why, why them and not me? And that's something I think that still bothers him to this day. I always say that he was spared in Liverpool because of the enjoyment that he can bring other people. Just after the war, my grandmother took me to see an Australian magician, uh, the great Levant. I was just so impressed with what he did, so that actually sparked my interest in magic. How old would you have been now? 15. Oh, gosh, that's yeah. amazing, isn't it? Yeah. He was lucky enough then to get a job at a magic shop called The Wizard's Den, and his love of magic just grew from there. He got to meet a lot of the old-time vaudevillian magicians, I suppose you'd, you'd call them. At the time, they were looking for somebody to demonstrate the tricks and all that. Oh, you must have and loved it, that. It, it, I did, and it just came natural for me. Mm. And, yeah, That's actually the top hat. At, so I would show that empty yeah. and then put it down and then produce all those clocks. Oh, that's heaps. Produce all the clocks out of it, yeah. In 1948, uh, my family decided to move to Australia, and uh, which was the best move they ever made. My parents had bought a guest house on the Gold Coast. We used to come down to Burley Heads on holidays, and just opposite the caravan park, there was a roller skating rink. And my sister and I used to go skating, and uh, that's where we met Arthur and his brother. Let's just say they locked eyes from across a crowded roller skating rink and the rest is history. <laughs> Dad was a mechanic when I was growing up and that's all I remember him doing. It was only every now and then he'd, he'd show the, the occasional magic trick. Dad had built our home and He'd built this bookcase that was built into the wall. But it was actually a secret door, so you'd push open the door to get into the garage. And we used to have a lot of fun with that. It was sort of the standard trick for new people coming to our house that Dad would put the three of us kids in front of this door and would hold a, a blanket up in front of the door. And so as soon as they did that, we'd flick the catch, open the door and just sneak down into the garage three kids gone just like that. I have found it is actually possible to hypnotise a piece of rope. So if I take this piece of rope and tell it to go, it falls asleep. I was performing mostly, I, I just do kids' parties. So I never intended to turn Once professional. It, awake, it wakes up and, of course, the rope wakes up. So then in the mid-70s, uh, I met a gentleman, Jerry Sullivan who'd come over from uh, England. He'd been an illusionist, a very suave, very nice fellow. And he wanted to start a show in Australia. And uh, we became friends and I offered to build a show for him. There was uh, three girls he employed for the act and uh, we were going down to Coffs Harbour to do a TV commercial for his show. And uh, it's early one morning on a wet road. And uh, he, unfortunately, uh, was going a little bit too fast. And he actually aquaplaned. The car did end up coming off the road and, and rolling. Jerry was badly pinned and not in a good way at all. Jerry knew he was passing away. And Arthur said, well, you're too much of a rascal to die. But I promise you, if anything happens to you, I'll make sure this show goes on the road, which he did. 
So he shut up his mechanic shop and he decided to become a magician full time, but no one wanted to hire him because they had no idea who Arthur Coughlin was. I tried everywhere, I tried to get bookings. I, I even offered to do free shows, but no, nobody wanted me. Dad met another illusionist, uh, Kevin McKnight, and they decided to get together and uh, form um, uh, an act called The Magicians. You're tricksters, aren't you? You're con men, oh, actually. No, not con men. Oh, no, no, definitely not con men. We don't tell a lie. No, no, no. Just no, stretch no. the truth of it. We can't lie straight in bed. No, uh, <laughs> no we're not con men, we're tricksters, yes. Dad thought he had to come up with a unique way to get people's attention. And that is when he did his first escape, and that was from 44-gallon drum in the shark tank at Jack Evans Purpose Pool at Tweed Heads. This escape has never been attempted anywhere in the world. Right? All of a sudden, uh, all this publicity is starting to happen. Never before have I seen as five TV channels at one time to witness something really fantastic here. The local radio station, every hour on the hour, they would do a live crossover to me to see how I was feeling, so, <laughs> yeah, it was a big day. Keep your eye open. I'm sure at any moment Arthur will make his escape. I've been concentrating so much on what I was doing. And there he is, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't until afterwards I thought, that place is full of sharks. <laughs> there is the drum. After the success of it, a producer from ABC, a big country, heard it on the radio, on the news, and he thought, this is fantastic. He said to me, look, if you would be willing to repeat this in the Sydney Harbour, well, I guarantee you'll get massive publicity out of it. Arthur knows he must be capable of holding his breath at least two minutes underwater to give himself sufficient time to break out of the drum. He needed to train to hold his breath underwater, so Kevin and I were taking him down Crumman Creek, I think it was, and hold him under there and see how long he could stay underwater before we let him up. One minute 25. He never liked us for that. <laughs> for this escape, Arthur will be lowered and suspended under the waters of Sydney Harbour from a boat winch. I was very nervous. Could be worse, yeah. I never, ever went to see any of Arthur's escapes. I would rather be at home and they let me know that it was successful. I feel better when Belle's not there because uh, she just worries too much. <laughs> what are you doing here? He's going to rip. to uh, Scoville River, please. Handcuffs <coughs> on. Arthur is the first man to attempt such an escape since the days 40 years ago of Houdini. Yeah. Would uh, you like to put the final lock on? Once I'm locked in, I'm locked in. I've got no outside help. I'm left to my own resources, so I've got to get out. Everything's exactly as it was, padlocks and everything there, as you can see. Everything goes through my mind as I'm being lowered down. Uh, have I done everything right? Just a little bit smart, a little bit smart. And then when I actually make the escape, it's a, it's a great relief to get to the surface and think, I've done it, yeah. Pressure. <laughs> yeah. An examination of the drum found all the locks, chains and rivets still intact. So the secret of the escape remains with Arthur. So how did you get out? I forget now. I, uh, must be somewhere I did it. I don't know. I don't know really because it's riveted, it's locked. It's, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, that's amazing, isn't it? Why did you want to do such dangerous escapes? But I only intended doing the one, actually. I never intended do, ever doing another escape. Oh, I didn't but know because that. it got so much publicity, everybody suddenly wanted mm. escapes. I was the executive producer and director of the Don Lane show. One of our researchers told me that Arthur Colgan was a great escapologist and would be terrific on the show. I was assured that it would be perfectly safe and I was assured that it was impressive, that it would look spectacular, and it was a legitimate escape, and he was a legitimate escapologist. We close it up, 
now. They were building this up all week. I said, I've got to watch this. All right, now the first lock is going on. I was glued to the television set. I could not get away from it because I was intrigued. Will he or won't he get out? The panel goes up in front now. The idea was I had to get out of the drum by the time it got up to that height and then hang on a two handles inside the box. So when the door fell open, the drum would fall out and, of course, I'd, I'd be hanging on to the two <laughs> handles here. When the rope reaches approximately 100 feet... When I'm going up in the air, I've got no idea how much time I've actually got left to get out of it. And uh, when I got stuck, uh, that was an absolute nightmare. I had no idea that there was any suggestion that he was in serious danger of dying on the show. There it comes! So you were only just out when that... I, 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 I swear, I just go, move my feet and it went, yeah. There he is! OK, ladies and gentlemen, See the look in my face when I come down? Uh, it was actually white, I think. <laughs> you look at this. Because I honestly didn't think I was going to make it. What saved me was a, a crew member and actually put another 10 feet on the rope, which just gave me a few more seconds. And if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here now. Coast to your Dini cheats death yeah. again. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Millions watch mm. Coglin yeah. escape from coffin that was massive. We could see every detail of what was happening. And for the life of me, after 40 years, I have no idea how he could possibly have escaped that barrel. The answer is printed in a book that I wrote. Uh, and uh, anybody got that book, it, the back of the book is sealed and that's the answer in that sealed section. Some people don't open it, they don't want to know the, how I got out. Uh, other people can't wait to rip it open and find out. <laughs> After that, Everyone knew the name Arthur Coughlin and I believe that's what helped him land a job as the magician at the Magic Castle. No trip to the Gold Coast was complete without seeing the Magic Castle or the Magic Mountain, which it became. And his shows were not just a little pulling a rabbit out of a hat, trick. It was big Las Vegas style shows, which there was no way in Australia that you could see that. I was only 17, 18 years old and I sat there and then when I saw Arthur disappear a motorbike and then appear from the back of the room, I said, that is pure magic. <laughs> Every magician, of course, needs an assistant, and uh, my assistant was my daughter, Helen. When I left school, I actually wanted to be a hairdresser, and I couldn't get a hairdressing apprenticeship anywhere, and at that same time, Dad needed a magician's assistant in his show. So I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, just until something better comes along, and nothing better ever did. So if you remember the Helen was a natural for the magic because she's very outgoing, she's bold, she's no fear. A bit like Dad in that way, I think. When I started out, there weren't a lot of women doing magic, let alone escapes. And I remember some of Dad's male magician friends saying that escapology was a male domain, that women couldn't do escapes. And to me, it was like, excuse me? <laughs> she was determined to prove, prove them wrong. I've been through so much myself and had so many close shaves. Escapology is not a thing I, that I wanted Helen to take any risks on, but she was determined. From that point, all I can do is help her. And I became the first woman in the world to perform Houdini's Water Torture Escape. How are you feeling, Helen? 
My heart's going about 100 <laughs> miles an hour at the moment. So. I was so nervous and at the time I'm thinking, what the hell am I doing? Why did I have to prove this to these, to these guys? Right, so there. My ankles were locked into a set of stocks. All set. I was lifted upside down and lowered into the tank of water and the stocks were locked on to the tank. Right out. Tell him to get those things out of the way, would you? Helen practised. She did a lot of underwater in the bath, <laughs> trying to stay underwater, and I know, I knew... You've got to have confidence. It's pretty frightening down there. You're by yourself, and once your head's under, you pass the point of no return. 148, 149, 150. I was out in a minute 50. I remember sitting on the top of the tank, and I had enough time to make sure my hair looked OK. <laughs> Wasn't that amazing? Wasn't that absolutely amazing? Oh. After that escape, we pretty much went off the scene for a bit because yes. we'd had a yeah. long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a family and I became a wedding celebrant. Yeah. A, a start up an interesting story. I had pretty much given it away. The 44 gallon drum, it's a guessing competition. Did I get in it or did I get in it? I'd done so many shows that I, I'd really had enough. I reckon you got in it, but I reckon it took you three and a half hours to get out. <laughs> I'd got to the stage, I'd be in the wings waiting to be introduced and think, I really don't want to go on. And then when you're introduced, you go, oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What you all smiles and that. So you put on this great act. Yeah, and then when you got to the, thank goodness, that's, thank goodness. That's so <laughs> Helen got in, locked her in, and she made the escape. Oh, wonderful. And then about three years ago, Dad brought to my attention a, a TV show called Penn and Teller Fool Us. Penn and Teller, they are two of the greatest magic minds in the world. Anybody that's an aspiring magician, you look at Penn and Teller and that's who you want to be. As part of the act, Teller doesn't talk, Penn does all the talking. They are very, very smart magicians, so to fool them at all is a big thing. Hi, I'm Helen Coglin, and I would like to show you a trick that I believe to be the only one of its kind in the world. To tell you the truth, Helen only ever went on the Penn and Teller to keep Arthur quiet. Which I'm going to film. That's when she put the audition tape in. So you can see the milk going in there. It all started with a glass of milk. I can take a soft, solid piece of copper and push it all the way through the glass of milk. You might think that was impossible. But we all know with magic that sometimes the impossible is actually possible. Take that right out the other end. We knew nothing about her. Uh, she pulled out these props that were deceptively Take simple. Off the tube. And all I can say is cheers. And then she did uh, just a, a trick with a stick and some milk that we were unable to figure out. It was it was pretty wonderful. We were we were thrilled to be fooled by her, and she had such a charming uh, presence. Okay, it is nice and tight. Okay, so the first one out wins the trophy. I went back the second time, yeah. and I fooled them again. I'd say I beat him. the third time, and I was the first person to fool them three times. And then that brought me to my fourth attempt, which we did last year. Hey. Because of the COVID situation, we couldn't get over to Las Vegas. So we did this one on Karawa Beach on the Gold Coast. Getting it down, this big solid steel cage, Getting it down on the beach was, yeah, it was challenging. <laughs> we find now that the escapes Helen's been doing on Penn and Teller, they don't have to be dangerous. Uh, we've done all that. I think people appreciate the skill of doing it safely. No, no more dangerous no, escapes. No. My main concern was the level of the sand that the escape's sitting on. 
because obviously I don't want to be in it for it to go plonk. But it seems to be okay, I think, now. Yeah, it's it seems all solid. Good. Yeah, all um, the girls are here, the crew's yeah. here. I think we're ready yeah. to go. Yeah, it's all set. Yep. Yeah. I'm actually getting a little bit nervous now. I had to wait for about another week or two before I was live streaming with Penn and Teller to say whether I fooled them or not. This is a 100% metal box. The only way out is magic. I've never had to escape from anything like this before. Gee, thanks, Dad. Let's do it. For those of you at home trying to figure out what I'm doing at just this moment, good luck. And to you too, Penn and Teller, I hope this escape has you both scratching your heads. Penn, Teller, you'll see the cage is still completely locked and the restraining shelves are still in place. It's as if I'd walked through solid steel. And maybe I did. OK, Helen, let's see if you can escape with a fourth trophy. You and your dad work on these things. You prepare yourself for these. But this time, we prepared for you. Because Teller, unbeknownst Ooh, to you, okay. he bought your dad's book. So it was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> they figured it, they, you know, they know how it's done. Did you go off the back, Helen? Start lowering that trophy, boys. Oh. I did not go out the back. Four times, Helen. Four times. <laughs> The biggest mystery about Helen's last appearance is how Teller read Arthur's book uh, and then saw the same trick that was in Arthur's book and couldn't figure it out. <laughs> if I'd have realized I had the book, I'd have been in doubt, yeah. Lucky they can't read. <laughs> <laughs> But you have to remember, uh, is it's really complicated stuff. You know, uh, when people think about magic tricks, they often think, well, there's going to be a one sentence explanation. Like there's, oh, there's a mirror there, or there's a screwdriver hidden. Yay! But with the stuff the Coglins do, uh, it is very far from simple. And there is no shame in being fooled by geniuses like that. Without Dad, there is no escape. There is no. Penn and Teller, one, two, three, or four trophies. There is none. So obviously, yeah, Dad plays a big part in it. Which he is. Oh dear. We're at the Tullabudra Beach School that we do some motivational speaking, some magic for the kids at the school camp. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome to the world of magic. My energy for magic and my love of magic has come back. A few years break was probably the best uh, thing I, ever. I think so. And uh, I just thoroughly enjoy doing it now. Yeah. Absolutely solid block of wood, except it does have a hole right through the centre. I enjoy the show because it motivates the kids. Now, logically, the only way to remove that block would be, of course, to untie the knot and pull the ropes out. I might do a thing and say, look, this isn't logical to do this, but because I think it's logical, doesn't mean it can't be done. It's better to try something and fail and learn from it than not try it all. Dad has been such a wonderful teacher for me, and not just magic, just everything, because there's nothing he can't do. So we have the white rabbit in the black house, and we have the black rabbit in the white house. My role now, and I totally enjoy it, is coming up with the ideas, the inventions, and letting Helen present them, which he does very, very well. So it's a, it's a great, it's a good combination. Why did you start doing magic? Because I like the challenge. While Dad's still inventing the magic, I think I'm still going to be enjoying, whether it's Penn and Teller, whether it's doing live magic, I'm going to take over the reins. Yeah, no, she Thank has, you very yeah. much. Mm -hmm. And continue to go from yeah, there. Dad. And I'm very happy about that. <laughs> Would 
you try and pull up this down. That's secure as well.